So if you would, turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans. And we'll be starting out at chapter 2. And I will tell you that it is not very often that I, when I'm preaching through a book of the Bible, it's not very often that I do an introduction for a specific chapter. I, I always do an introduction of the book itself, but not very often do I do a, an intro to a chapter. Um, I don't think I've ever prepared an introduction like I have for this chapter um, for various reasons. This chapter is not easy. This chapter is one that if you are going to be sitting here thinking about what you're going to have for lunch or what you're going to do this afternoon or what work you have to do tomorrow or whatever, you're, you're probably not going to follow. You you got us. You got to really stick with me. I mean that's that's always the case. But th this is one of those where you you really need to track with me. I, I will throw a shout out to I consulted for this introduction uh, uh, quite a bit from the preceptaustin.com commentary. Uh, it, it just, I got a lot of help from it. Uh, it includes comments from theologians like Warren Wiersbe, Charles Hodge, R. Kent Hughes, and William Newell um, that I, I used comments of theirs and worked into to my thoughts here. Now, I, I want to first, I want to actually go back to a comment that I made a couple of weeks ago when we were in Romans chapter 1. And in, in, a, in a sermon a couple weeks ago, I said this. At that time, I said, starting at, at verse 18 in chapter 1, through chapter 3 and verse 20, the Holy Spirit led Paul to present an indictment, an indictment against all human beings, clearly demonstrating why people need the righteousness of God. And that we cannot understand our need for the righteousness of God until we understand the depth of our ugliness of sin against God. We cannot understand the infinite blessing of salvation until we understand the infinite horror of what we need saved from. And what we need saved from is what? A deserved punishment for eternity in the lake of fire. And also, we cannot understand the infinite blessing of salvation and why we need to be saved from that eternal death and hell until we grasp that we are, again, completely and totally unrighteous, unholy, an abomination to God because of our actions. You, you, every one of you, and me, Every human being has the terminal disease of complete and total unrighteousness before Almighty God. Last week we obviously looked at a specific sin of homosexuality in verses 26 and 27 of chapter 1. But then remember we also saw in verses 28 through 32 that, that God turning people over to their own sinfulness results in much more than sexual immorality as verses 28 through 32 can be seen as a comment on the total depravity of mankind. Those verses provide a, a whole laundry list of the sins of human beings. Everything we studied in verses 18 through 31 or 32 in Romans chapter 1 in the past two weeks, all of that, in, including all the sinfulness and the, the total unrighteousness that we looked at last week, all that leads into what today I call an in our face declaration by God that begins here in chapter 2 and will continue through verse 20 of chapter 3. We are all a part of that sinfulness and unrighteousness that we looked at last week. That is the natural inclination of your heart and my heart. And your heart, whoever's watching this at some point. The fires of hell should be our destiny. Every one of us. That's what we deserve. That's what God calls out here in His Word. Again, this is a part of God's charge against all of humanity. All human beings. And we, obviously, are a part of that group. And if you are thinking as you 
hear this sitting here or as you hear it on the recording at some point, if you're sitting there thinking, well, I'm not like those awful heathen sinners you know, that we read about there in Romans chapter 1, well, then you know what I have to say to you? Then you really need to listen to what I have to say today out of Romans chapter 2, which is only what, of course, God has to say in Romans chapter 2. The general statement here in Romans is that there are no groups of people who fall outside of the categorization of the worst of sinners. <laughs> that describes all of us. There are none of us that fit outside that list. Well, I'm not as bad as they are. We are, we are all sinful, horribly, in the eyes of God. As William Newell said about, he said this about church-going people, people who sit in church pews, William, William Newell said this about those who read these verses in Romans that they need to pay attention. He said, quote, The doors into the death chamber of self-righteousness so easily open to us church pew sitters. We readily fall into the delusion that God is speaking in this chapter concerning only heathen idolaters and that it cannot possibly be speaking to us. End quote. Understand now, many Bible scholars today do believe that the original context of Romans chapter 2 was most specifically relative to Jewish people and their belief that they were in good spiritual standing before God just because they were God's covenant people, His chosen people. Many of these Jewish people believed that as long as they remained connected to the Jewish com community, connected to Abraham through being a, a, a Jew, through the observance of the Mosaic law, through the, the practice of the, the covenant sign of their relationship with God, their covenant with God, uh, the, the, the uh, practice of circumcision, that they thought if they did that stuff, as long as they did that stuff, then individual Jews would be saved. They would go on to a good eternal life through the promise that was made to Abraham. But each individual Jew needed to understand that they were guilty of sin. And by the perfectly righteous standard of God, every moral and or religious Jew was just as guilty as the heathen Gentiles who didn't even have the Mosaic Law, let alone observe it. Jews could not consider Romans 1, 18-32 as applying only to heathen Gentiles and thus pronounce their judgment and condemnation upon them because that same judgment and condemnation was upon the Jew as well. Both those Jews, the righteous in their eyes Jews of that day, in the original audience, as well as all of the unbelieving Gentiles could only find forgiveness and salvation one way, and that was how? Jesus. Through saving faith in Jesus Christ. Now I need you to listen. I'm going to be reading in here, we're going to read these verses, and it talks about you know, how they shouldn't be passing this judgment on the heathen Gentiles. Please don't be like the majority of people in churches today and think this is about, oh, you don't, you don't say anything to me about, me about my sin. You're not supposed to judge me. That's not what this means. Let me tell you that right up front. Please don't ever go that way in front of me because I'll start having a seizure or something. <laughs> that is not what that is about. I am so sick of hearing that from people that go to church. That's not what this is about. This is about certain, a certain group of people pronouncing, pronouncing condemnation upon other people for their sins without understanding and accepting that they are just as guilty. That they were full of unrighteousness as well. I want to tell you again, original context, this was directed to the Jews of that time when this was originally written, but still today, various religious people fall into this same category, this same fault. They think that because they're part of some faith group, some group of religious people, whatever it is, whatever flavor it is, they think because they're associated with that group that they're okay with God. 
That by that association, they're good with God. Because they belong to this church. Because they were baptized into this church. Because they did this or they did that. They're, whatever they're associated with, they're good with God because of that. They think that because they went through some kind of a baptism or a church membership ritual or whatever, that they're going to go to heaven because of that association. But the reality is that without true saving faith in Jesus Christ for the, for the forgiveness of sins, a person is bound for hell. I don't care what group of religious people they belong to. Because they're just as guilty of sin as people who don't go to church at all. Being religious doesn't get you saved. Practicing religion doesn't get you saved. Belonging to a church that supposedly by your association with that church makes you a part of the people of God, which it doesn't, because it doesn't get you saved. Being more moral and less evil than other folks doesn't get you saved. Being more moral and less evil than other folks doesn't get you saved because you're still immoral and you still have evil in your heart. The Bible tells us that. All of us. Mo many religious people do not have saving faith in Jesus. That's the sad truth. Many religious people do not have saving faith in Jesus Christ. They pronounce condemnation on people who don't go to church. They pronounce condemnation on people who don't practice religion. But the reality is that their better morality, though they're still not perfectly moral, and their being less evil, though they're still evil, doesn't keep them out of hell. They still deserve hell. They still need Jesus to keep them out of hell. Thing is, it was easy to convince the, the Jews of Paul's day when, when the Holy Spirit led him to write the book of Romans. It was easy to convince Jews of the sinfulness of these pagan Gentile people who were doing the kind of stuff we looked at in chapter 1 last week. That was easy to convince them that. It's also easy to convince religious people of that today. Our fellow church-going people, we look down our noses at these other people who don't go to church or don't practice any religion or whatever. And it's easy for us to, yeah, we agree, they're, they're unrighteous, they're, they're deserving of hell, right? It's not nearly so easy to convince, or it wasn't easy to convince the Jews of, of Paul's day that their complete and total unrighteousness is just as bad. And it's no, law, it's no different today with people who are, in their minds, religious or moral or more moral and religious than many other people they see. It's tough to convince them that you are actually unrighteous, evil before God, and deserving of condemnation for all of eternity in the lake of fire. Religious people don't like to hear that. Church-going people don't like to hear that. How religious people miss <laughs> that it's only through true saving faith in Jesus Christ that you get saved, that you get forgiven of your sins is beyond me, but it happens all the time in churches. And I say this again, many, many relatively moral and religious people are on the way to hell because they do not have saving faith in Jesus and yet they often pronounce judgment and condemnation on heathens who don't go to church and who maybe openly practice sin as a lifestyle. Now, I'm going to be the first to tell you, very often these people who don't go to church and who, who can maybe live very openly sinful lives and so forth, they really, many of them really are heathens who are on the way to hell. But that's not the point. <laughs> that's not the point here of Romans chapter 2. The point is that pronouncing judgment on those who are on the way to hell uh, for their sins while ignoring the fact that you yourself are on the way to hell because of your sins and that you haven't come to saving faith in Jesus, no matter how religious you look or what church you go to or whatever, that's the point. People 
announcing the judgment on other folks that they're going to hell, and yet they don't get it that they are too. <laughs> so, let's take a quick look at verses 1 through 24. Quick is relative, of course. A relative term with me especially. But we're going to take a quick look at verses 1 through 24, remembering that the original audience and the original context was primarily the Jews, but that it also describes any self-proclaimed moral and religious people today who act the same way. That's one of the things to, to take from this. Yes, the, the, you've got this Jewish focus because the Jews thought they were all it because they were God's people, regardless of what they did, as long as they had these certain associations of being a Jew. But in reality, they're, they're pronouncing judgment on these, these unrighteous Gentiles, but the fact was they were in the same boat as the Gentiles were. And that's the same thing that's still today, that people want to maybe pronounce a, a condemnation, or they're actually like they're playing God and saying, You're, they're going to hell when they themselves are on the way to hell as, as well because they don't have saving faith in Jesus. Verses 1 through 4. Let's read it. Chapter 2, 1 through 4. You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. Whose truth? God's truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to do what? to lead you to repentance. Jews who pronounce judgment on sinful heathen Gentiles failed to acknowledge their own sin, their own helplessness. And they had no excuse in the matter. If they could see the condemnation that would result from the sins of pagan, listen now, track with this, if they could see the condemnation that would result from the sins of pagan Gentiles, then they should have been able to see the same condemnation that they themselves deserved. They should have been able to see that. Remember again, the problem was not condemning sin. The issue at hand here is not calling sin, sin. That's what you're going to hear from people today. When they say, don't judge me, they're saying, don't tell me about my sin. Don't call that sin. You have no right to call that sin. I'm not calling it sin. God calls it sin. And it is up to us to declare what God says is sin as sin. That's not what's going on here. What's going on here is people who are sinning themselves and do not have saving faith in Jesus proclaiming that other people are heading to hell because of their sins while ignoring their own. And the fact that they have not come to the one and only way to be forgiven of their sins, that is what this is about. God's judgment of sin is based upon His perfect truth, and the Jews could not have thought, or should not have thought, that they had an excuse about it, or some kind of an exemption. Neither should self-righteous and religious people today. And it's scary, scary, how often that is the case. No one should dare presume that God will not bring judgment on their sin. And again, I've said before about how many people I've heard over the years say stuff like, well, God knows how I am, you know. He'll forgive me. He knows how I am. Like, without remorse, just, ah, oh, that's how I am. God knows me. He'll, you know, he'll forgive me for it. And no effort to turn away from that sin. Just keep living the way I want to live. God will, He'll forgive me. That's a dangerous presumption to place on God because He says in His Word He will not do that. God might be patient and kind with a person's sin for a certain period of time, but His tolerance has its limits and His patience, God's patience is never a sign of letting sin go unpunished. God's patient kindness is intended to give people the chance to do what? Repent. Repent. The only reason that, that I wasn't struck down like right like that many years ago was because God was giving me patience to finally come to repentance of my sins. 
He had every right to squish me like a bug. But in his love and patience and kindness, he let me go. And he allowed me actually to go through some really tough stuff in my life to why finally he got my attention. But it's not indefinite. After a while, the punishment will come from God. And ultimately when it will come is when a person leaves this life after which there is no turning back. Justice must be applied. God's justice will apply, be applied to every human being. Every human being. Those of us with saving faith in Jesus, how is, how is God's justice applied for our sins? It was applied through Jesus Christ on the cross. He took the punishment for us who would come to Him in saving faith. And thus, God's justice was applied. But if you don't come to Jesus, guess how God's justice will be applied to you? In the lake of fire for all of eternity. One way or the other, the justice of God will be applied to the sins of every human being. It's just a matter of whether Jesus will bear that justice for you or whether you will bear it yourself. And that's a big difference. Let's read verses 5 through 11. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up what? You are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. When His righteous judgment will be revealed, God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory and honor and immortality, He will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. Stubbornness. Refusal to acknowledge sin and, and repent of it calls down the penalty of punishment from God. The wrath of God builds slowly but surely until it eventually crushes the guilty person on the day of reckoning, on their day of reckoning. We will see a little later in the book of Romans that what is described in these verses, some of these words that we just read, this is not salvation by works that this is talking about here. Rather, as is consistently taught throughout the, the New Testament, it is about works done because of salvation, works done as evidences of someone who is truly saved. The way people live day in and day out, listen to me, the way someone lives day in and day out shows the condition of their heart. The overall testimony... The overall witness of their lives, day in and day out, shows who is truly saved and who is not. Those who consistently and obediently serve God by doing what He calls good, as they seek the glory and, and the honor and the immortality that, that only God can give them, they demonstrate that they have true saving faith. They show that they are destined to receive eternal life. Those who consistently do the things that God calls evil, understand the things that God calls evil, whether you think it is or not doesn't get a vote. Those who do the things that God calls evil in His Word, the Bible, and who reject the perfect truth of God, which is the Bible, His Word, they show that they do not have true saving faith. Now you ought to, got to understand again, there are a lot of people sitting in churches that would fit into that category. And you need to understand that. What an awful, devastating reality that is. People who think they're good, think they're good to go, and in reality are not. Because their lives demonstrate that they consistently do things that God says is evil. And they do not turn from it. And oftentimes, there's not only no repentance, but they celebrate what they do. 
or brag about what they do or whatever. They are des destined to experience the awful, awful wrath of God. All people in that first group, those who consistently and obediently serve God by doing what He calls good in His Word, people in that group will experience glory and honor and peace for eternity, whether Jew or Gentile. And all people who are in the second group, again, the ones who, the, the ones who consistently do what God says they ought not to do, they will experience eternal damnation and punishment, again, both Jew and Gentile. No difference. Indeed, both salvation and judgment are both first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, simply because God chose the Jews to work through them. He worked first with the Jewish people, and then through Him, through them. Then He works with the Gentile nations, the rest of the nations of the world, the rest of the peoples of the world. But God shows no favoritism. Nobody receives special favor because of their eth ethnicity. Eternal destiny is not determined by ethnicity, nor by what religious group that you belong to. Just because the Jews were a special people and received special blessings of God as He worked through them, doesn't mean that they don't have to come to saving faith in Jesus to be forgiven of their sins. And neither does it apply to a lot of church-sitting people in places like America where we have far more than most of the rest of the world has and been blessed by God in special ways, but every one of us still needs Jesus Christ to be forgiven of our sins. Verses 12 through 16 explain some more of this. <clears throat> 12 through 16. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by that law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who what? Obey, Obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, even when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves even though they don't have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written where? On their hearts, in their what? In their consciences, also bearing witness and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. The Jewish people received revelation from God in the Mosaic Law. Gentile people did not receive the Mosaic Law. We didn't, the law was not given to us. But what did we receive? What did we talk about earlier in chapter 1? What, what kind of revelation did God give to all people? General revelation, the creation all around us. Romans chapter 1 talked about how that, just seeing what's around us, is enough to cause us to seek out God. It should be enough. It is enough. But many people do not. And by that alone, they are without excuse. But then, as I talked about in Romans chapter 1, in a, along with the general revelation of creation, I also talked about these verses I, I said would be coming up in chapter 2, where the other revelation God has given every one of us is this built-in thing in our consciences. This, he, he has built it, even though we, don't, we, have not, we were not given the, the Mosaic Law to understand what God says is right and wrong, He has imprinted within our being within our fiber, within our DNA, we have some degree of understanding of the things that God says are wrong and the things that God says are right and that there is a God and that He is there, there is this One who should be worshipped and so forth. There is a degree of that that is built into us. And again, that along with general revelation of the creation around us, with both of those revelations from God that Gentiles have received, we have no excuse either. The Jews have the law, we have the general revelation of nature and what God has placed in, inside of every human being. And that again is enough to condemn us if we don't seek out the God whom our consciences, our hearts tell us is there.
The main point of all this is that those who sinned under the law, who sinned under the law? The Jews who had the law, right? The Mosaic law was given to them. And so what he was saying in this verse then, those who sinned under the law, they will perish, right? They will perish. They will be judged by the law. Why is that? Why would the Jews who had the law perish because of the law? Because it showed no one could follow it. Why did they perish? I, I still hear murmuring. They perish. They will perish because they didn't obey it. They didn't keep the whole law. They will perish. They will be judged by the law because though they keep parts of it, they didn't keep all of it, and therefore they deserve judgment. What about people who are apart from the law that are spoken of in these verses? Who are apart from the law? Gentiles. Gentiles. And yet, for Gentiles, we who are apart from the law, the Mosaic law, yet we will perish as well because of what? Because of the revelation, the general revelation from God of His creation around us and what He has imprinted into our hearts and our consciences and so forth. And we don't follow that and therefore we are judged as well. We will perish as well. There is no out from it. Jew or Gentile, apart, apart from the law or in the law, either way, every person condemned. And deserving judgment. That's what this is saying. Remember, again, don't miss the whole tenor of what this is leading up to. The second part of chapter 1, chapter 2, and, and a lot of chapter 3. It's all to set this declaration that God says, You are all sinful people and you all deserve eternal punishment for disobeying me. That This is all the theology setting the stage. Have you heard anything about salvation yet? I've brought it up, but in the, in the words here, have you heard anything about it yet? The answer is no, because first of all, God through Paul is setting the stage of why we need to be saved. That's what this is all about. And like I said a couple weeks ago, that thing that God built into people and the fact that we can be held accountable simply for recognizing a Creator God by, by His creation around us, that is the answer to that question we often hear about how is it fair for people living in upper Zimbabwe that never saw a Bible or heard about Jesus? How, how is it fair? Be because they have the general revelation around them plus something built into them that should cause them to seek out God, but they do not. And neither would we. Unless He reached into our hearts and got a hold of us by His Holy Spirit. It isn't simply those who hear the law. Who, who heard the law? The Jews. The Jews. It's not those who hear the law who are righteous. It's only those who completely what? Obey the law. Who will be declared righteous. Whether they are Jews who read or hear the law, or whether it be Gentiles who sense the law in, their, in our consciences, the only way that we can be declared righteous by God is if we completely keep it all. What's the problem with that statement then? No one can perfectly keep it. Nobody. No Jew perfectly kept the, the Mosaic law. No Gentile ever perfectly followed the law that God imp, uh, imprinted into their DNA. Therefore, every human being deserves judgment. You, you, see, you see where this is funneled to? We must recognize that since no one completely obeys God's law, no human being, Jew or Gentile, can be declared righteous by God on their own merit. There is nobody that is good enough of a person to be declared righteous by God on their merit. No one. Every human being thus deserves condemnation by God in a judgment of perfect justice. And as I said, take notice that no way out of that condemnation has been presented yet in Romans. Praise God, it's coming. And, and frankly, I look a lot forward to talking about that. But we have to talk about this first. Why? We can't talk about the good news until what? You've got to understand the bad news. The reason that there's a good news is because there's a bad news. And the bad news is what we're plowing through here. You follow? Verses 17 through 24. We'll close with these for today.
17 through 24. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know His will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, which of course they did, you then, who teach others, do you not what? Teach yourself. You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You, you who say that people should not commit adultery, do, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob the temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? Did they? Did the Jews? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> unfortunately, yes. To all above, unfortunately. As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Because of who? Because of the Jews. Because of the Jews who were to be the light of, the war of God to the world, to the Gentile nations of the world. Because of the Jews, though, God's name was blasphemed because of their behavior. Here again, we see words clearly directed to, to Jews in the original context who had great advantages. Great advantages being the chosen people of God, right? I, I mean... Wow. I mean, still today, people have a problem with that. You know, well, what, what made the Jews so great to be God's chosen people? What made them so great? Nothing. Nothing. It was because of the sovereign grace of God. There wasn't anything special about them. That's the whole point. These Jews who generally believed that these advantages that they had, being God's chosen people, meant God wouldn't judge them. He wouldn't judge them like He judges these wicked heathen Gentiles. And yet even though they had these advantages and thought of themselves as being better than the heathen nations of Gentiles, they sinned as badly as the Gentiles that they so despised. Quickly, eight things of the, the Jews of the first century, you know, had or are mentioned here in these verses. They were Jews. They were God's chosen people. The apple of His eye, Zechariah 2.8. They relied on the law. God hasn't chosen another person, another people group to reveal the law to on Mount Sinai other than His chosen people, the Jews. Number three, they had a relationship with the one true God of the universe, the living God. They, all the other Gentile nations up to some point in the world, all they had was they worshipped man-made things of wood and stone and iron and so forth. Made up stuff they worshipped. The Jews worshipped the living God. Number four, they knew the will of God. They were the only ones that had special revelation from God by the way of the Old Testament Scriptures. Number five, they followed a superior way of living, a, a lifestyle, a worship that God said, live this way. This is how I want you to live. They had that. Nobody else had that. Number six, they were instructed by God's law, by the great value and of the decrees of Yahweh. Number seven, they were called by God to be advisors to the nations of the world, guides for the blind, lights for those in darkness, instructors of the foolish, and teachers of spiritual infants. And number eight, they had in the law the ultimate expression of knowledge and truth. They had God Himself. The people of Israel did. And again, despite such a privileged position as God's chosen people, Despite such a privileged position, they did not live and conduct themselves as people who were in such a position. They didn't live in any kind of a way to live up to what God had given them, what God, where God had placed them uh, in a position of great privilege. They taught others, but they didn't teach themselves. They preached against stealing, but they stole themselves. They preached against adultery, but they committed adultery. They despised idols but stole from pagan temples. They bragged about the law, yet they dishonored God because they what? They disobeyed it. As a result, instead of being a light of revelation to the, of God to the Gentiles, they caused the Gentiles to blaspheme the name of God. See Ezekiel chapter 20 and 36 for some exam, good examples. Certainly the Gentiles had sinned. Certainly Gentiles deserve God's judgment. From Abraham forward, the Jews were supposed to be used of God to save the Gentiles from their sins. But the Jews' sins were so blatant that the Gentiles laughed at the name of their God. <laughs> you, what, what, what a God you have. Look at you. 
Look at what you're doing. You don't even obey your, this great God you claim to have. The Jews' sins were as deserving of judgment as the sins of the Gentiles. And in fact, in fact, the Jews were actually more deserving of judgment. Why? Because of the privileged position they had been given. How much they had, had been given and revealed to them of God. Not only were they as worthy of judgment, they were more worthy of judgment. They were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles, but instead they left the Gentiles in utter darkness. Once again, I will caution you, if you are feeling like you have an urge to look down your spiritual snobby nose at the Jews, look at the great privilege that we have today as God's chosen ones. Look at the wonderful blessings that Christians have as the only group of people who will ever have the privilege to be called what? The, 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 not children of God. Others could be children of God. But we are the only ones that will ever be called the church. We will be the only ones who will ever be called the body of Christ. We are the only ones who will ever be called the bride of Christ. No other human beings other than those of us who come to saving faith in the church age will ever be referred to that way. We are a very special chosen people as well. And yet how often we fail our Lord. How often we who possess countless copies of the complete Word of God, not just the Old Testament, but the New as well, how often we fail to study and learn it, let alone obey it. How often we cause God's name to be blasphemed because of our hypocrisy. Because of our disobedience. Because of our failure to practice what we preach. We had better examine ourselves to be sure that we are actually in the faith. Don't miss. Many of these Jews... I mean, they thought that they were these privileged people that were in good shape with God, right? But the reality was that most of them what? Were not. Let me tell you something. It's no different in the church today. No different with many people who have multiple copies of the Word of God, the Bible, laying around in their homes. No different about many people who have gone to church maybe even all their lives in such a privileged position. And yet, what we've established earlier, many who, if you ask them why they're going to heaven, they'll tell you everything but Jesus. They'll talk about following the golden rule. They'll talk about, I taught Sunday school for 40 years. Uh, my parents started that church. Uh, all, wait a minute, I'm asking you why you, you think you're going to heaven and you're not even bringing up the, the only way you can get there. That is true about so many people I have talked to. Church-going people. Despite the great privilege that we have in churches today, the reality is there's a lot of people that really need to check themselves by the Word of God. We better test ourselves. All of us better test ourselves. Do we not realize that Christ Jesus is in us? Unless what? Of course, unless we fail the test. It says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Maybe Jesus really isn't in us. Just because we're in the church doesn't mean that Jesus is in us. Does the way you live your life prove that you have true faith in Jesus? In the ways we talked about here earlier today. Do you find sweet relief at the feet of Jesus as you regularly kneel before Him in deep sorrow and repentance over your sins. If you can't recall the last time you did that, you got a problem. Because unless you're different than every other person I know, we all sin plenty, don't we? Amen. Do not take for granted that just because you prayed some prayer 30 years ago that you're in good shape with God. If you don't find yourself coming before Jesus in repentance over sins that you've committed yesterday or this morning, something's wrong. Is Jesus really more important to you than anything else on this earth? 
Is he? Really? Can you really look at him in the eye and say that? Today, do you really need to cry out to Jesus in true saving faith? Pleading for Him to save you and forgive you of your sins. Do you need to cry out to Jesus, Do not pass me by. Please, don't pass me by. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, what? Do not pass me by. Let me at the throne of mercy find such a sweet relief. Kneeling there in deep contrition, deep repentance and sorrow over my sin. Help me. Help me in my unbelief. Trusting only in your merit, would I seek your face. Heal my wounded, broken spirit. Save me by your grace. Thou the spring of all my comfort. More than life to me, you are Jesus. Whom have I on earth besides thee? Whom in heaven? But Thee, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others you are calling, please do not pass me by. I pray that that's your heart cry this morning. And maybe even if you think it was a long time ago, maybe it's time that you renew it. That's our closing hymn. Do not pass me by. Pass me not. 489. 489.